Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name's Astrid, and I'm going to talk a little bit about managing distributed systems over longer periods of time. So what does it really mean to do this? You know, what are we talking about here? Now, one thing is this really does apply to distributed systems. Um, I'm going to be talking about sort of a loosely decoupled kind of service-based architecture. Google's been doing this for some time. Um, when I was looking for pictures for this slide, I was looking for kind of the stereotypical, like, open road, leads off to the horizon kind of shot. But I realized in a hurry that that would be a horrible lie, right? Like, if you're doing anything over a long period of time, particularly something complex, there's no way to know when you start out, you know, exactly where you're going to end up. You have no idea what's going to happen, what you're going to need to do, and you might not even recognize it when you're done. So this is actually a picture of the Sacramento River emptying into the bay. And it's kind of chaotic, but I also think it's kind of pretty. So let me start with some backstory. So in 2004, I joined a small company. And it actually was pretty small at the time. Um, Google in 2004 had about 2,200 employees, maybe about 800 in engineering. Um, it seemed huge. It had already been very successful. It was just post-IPO. But Google in that era really only did one thing. It basically just did web search. Like you can kind of see a list of all the services Google had at the time up here. And so go most of Google's explosive kind of horizontal growth was yet to come. So at the time, I was working with the production engineering team, which grew into site reliability and the technical infrastructure engineering teams. And it was a great time to join Google because that was the point at which we were starting to roll out the production infrastructure that was going to carry us through about the next 10 years of scaling. Um, this was the start of the Borg ecosystem. And this was a time when we were talking about things like, how should we organize our config files? And what should we name the jobs? And how is anyone ever going to find anything? And it's really easy to get kind of caught up in these arguments and have them become religious debates. But the truth is, you don't really know how it's going to end up. So the first rule of planning for the long game is to imagine that you're going to be very, very successful. And I think of this as kind of an existence proof, because the truth is, like, if you're not successful, you're going to be looking for another job in a couple of years. And so like, none of this is really going to apply. So we should probably just take this as a given. Um, but you also don't really know where you're going to end up. Every year on Google's annual employee survey, Google Geist, um, I check the box for, I'll probably still be at Google in a year. And I always check the box for, I probably won't still be at Google in five years. Um, and I've been wrong a lot of times. So given that you can't really precisely plan for the future, the one thing that you can do is act as if you're going to have to live with the consequences. So the thing about complexity is it increases with time. It increases with scale. It increases with growth. It increases with success. It also increases with failure. So it's not really a metric so much as just an artifact of people working together over a period of time. You know, this is, this is something that you can't erase. You can't roll back. Um, but what you can do is manage it. And you have to manage it if you don't want to end up dealing with nothing but that. So the first thing that I like to think about when I'm thinking about this is actually the team and not the system at all. Like, good teams and good people are precious. They're the hardest thing to find for a company. And building a good team, you know, I, probably all of you have been involved in that. And it's really difficult, right? It's a huge investment. So you don't want people to be sort of popping off to take the less stressful life of a primary school teacher on a regular basis. Like you kind of, once you've got your people and you've trained them, you really want to keep them with you. And they're also your most precious resource in terms of like knowing things about how the system works. So one of the things about dealing with really rapid growth is that it puts a lot of demands on the team and on the company. And my main rule for all of this is that your job as an engineer in an engineering organization is to make sure that adding scale doesn't have to mean adding people. Your goal is to be able to enable exponential scaling with sublinear team growth. So otherwise, you're going to end up needing a hell of a lot of people. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of generally how systems grow. And so most systems start pretty small. Like, it's just kind of a small test instance, you know, small production deployment. You're dealing with your first users. You're iterating pretty quickly. Um, this is a good time to not worry too much about infrastructure. Uh, one of the rules of infrastructure is that too much is about as bad as too little. This is not a time when you really want to be thinking about, like, building scaffolding, building enormous systems, really building anything except your product. But over time, all systems get more complex. Um, there's vertical scale, so you know, taking more QPS, more users, more traffic, more growth. And general rule of thumb for vertical scaling is that every order of magnitude requires a bunch more boxes, because you're hitting choke points that are going to require some refactoring. So just scale, vertical scale alone adds boxes. 
But there's also what I like to think of as horizontal scale, which is adding more subsystems, adding more services, adding more products. Um, and all of those require additional support as well. So this is actually, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a rough version. Um, every system at Google has its own massive exploded diagram of all of the boxes that connect together to make a service. And so think about this getting complex, but then think about what happens when you've got service, you're going from you know, dozens of services to hundreds, and I honestly think today there are probably thousands. Um, there's a pretty high operational cost associated with this, and there's also a high complexity cost in terms of just like cognitive bandwidth on the engineering team. So the first thing about what, what's happening during this phase is that your job is not to limit growth. When you're trying to keep complexity in check, one of the worst things you can do is say, like, oh, you can't launch that. It's too complex. It's going to make things worse. Like, you really don't want to do that at this phase. You want to be enabling enormous growth. You want to be enabling all the growth that the product can drive. Um, the only way I know of to do this is to get out of the business of managing machines. And I'm really happy to see that the, there's a lot more tooling available around this in the cloud world today. Um, for a long time, some of the stuff that we were doing at Google wasn't something, you know, I couldn't talk about managing distributed systems five years ago because it was still secret, but it's not a secret anymore. So that's kind of awesome. Um, at Google, this is really built on the Borg ecosystem and kind of all of the systems that surround that. But it applies equally to AWS auto-scaling, elastic load balancing, all of those kinds of things. Because it's not really about the system that you're using. What it's about is taking away the overhead of managing individual machines, managing machine and environment configuration, and getting to a place where your engineers can run their own services. And so the second thing is, and this is really the kind of managing complexity part, at this point, you want as much standardization as you can get. And it's not an absolute, right? Like, you don't need to have, like, the plan for how things are developed that so applies across the whole company. But basically, like, anything you can standardize is going to pay off in spades. Like, if you put all of your config files in one place, that probably would really help. If you have a consistent naming system for how your jobs are named, that probably really helps. Um, one of the things that Google did really early, which way predates me, is that all servers that are built on the common code base export a tiny, they have a little tiny HTTP server that exports a status page. So for any given server at Google, you can typically go to a slash status C URL, and it'll tell you stuff about like when it was built, like how much traffic it's getting, um, whether it's up, all of those kinds of things. Um, and this isn't much, like it's really a tiny thing, but it's the, kind of this common language for troubleshooting and debugging. And so in a situation where like a person going on call might be paged for a dependency they've never heard of. Anything that you can do to kind of make it so that you know, they can start somewhere with figuring out like, even just how to page the guy who built the thing is really helpful. Which kind of brings us back to maintainability. Um, one of the general rules of, of, sort of engineering for maintainability is to keep an eye on what's costing time and to consider cost pretty broadly. Um, you know, this, is often, this often comes into play in automation. But one of the things that I think is really important is to understand that a lot of times, um, if you're not careful, you can just end up moving complexity around. Um, it's no good to make you know, all the right dev choices, have your dev team kind of moving really fast and have your ops load exploding. Kind of need, when you're making a large set of changes, you also need to think about like, you know, who's going to look after this? How's that going to be maintained? Is there anything we can do to make it cheaper? And one of the biggest things that you can do to make this cheaper, especially in a very diverse system, is that every single one of those boxes needs to be able to look after itself. And it also needs to be able to look after its connections to others. So there's a few sort of general good practices around this that we try to enforce everywhere. Um, during my time in SRE, we enforced them with enthusiasm and occasionally aggression, um, which, were, which are a few basic things. Like, if you talk to another server, have a timeout, and do something sensible when that timeout expires. Um, if you talk to another server, uh, if it doesn't get back to you, include exponential back off before you try again. So try in two seconds, try in four seconds, try in eight seconds, try in whatever. Um, one side note is that jitter is important here because otherwise you will trigger lockstep bugs um, anytime you lose a layer. Um, another one is just that all of these systems should be able to in some way behave at least reasonably under degraded modes. Uh, once you get a diverse enough system for any given call that you make, you know, some box is going to be flipping out, and you're not going to get a good response back from it. So it's really important to understand, like, which responses are critical for your product and which responses are not. Drop anything that's not critical. Try to return a response. There are times when that's not the right thing to do, like if you have a stateful system or a banking transaction or things like that, so you need to know when to apply it. But in general, 
broadly, especially in a stateless system, doing something's better than doing nothing. And over time, even with those things, the burden of kind of maintaining all of these pieces just kind of adds up. One way that you can drop that is using shared infrastructure. And so eventually you kind of get to a place where like, all of those boxes are really representing significant amounts of overhead. And you kind of want to be able to specialize. And if you're large enough to have an infrastructure team, um, this is usually when that happens. Uh, this is sort of roughly equivalent to you know, any, any hosted infrastructure team as well. And it's kind of appealing because like, the box diagram looks a lot cleaner. Like, hey, your business logic goes in the pink box, and you don't have to worry about the rest. But the truth is, and any of you guys in like, an enterprise legacy system will know this, making any change to the pink box is probably going to require making changes to all the other boxes as well. So in this kind of situation, like, you're, you're really taking a loss of flexibility in exchange for getting the gains in scale that this can provide. Um, you have to wait for rollout schedules. You have to wait for config pushes. You have to do testing. Like, there's a lot of shared fate here. So during the consolidation phase, when you're starting to think about like, shared infrastructure, maybe not doing the same thing like five times over, it's really important to pick your moment. Like, Early on is probably not your moment. You really don't want to optimize too early. You want the flexibility. Um, but there'll come a point where your engineering team is coming to you, and they're like, so we're going to make another image processing pipeline. And you're like, don't we have three of those? And they're like, ours is different. It has special requirements. Those requirements are not like any other requirements, so we need our own. Um, this is a point where you have to kind of think about the world that you want to end up in. Like somewhere between about like one and five identical systems, you're going to eventually need to make a stand and say, like, maybe you guys should try to work together. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to end up eventually just sort of picking through the post-apocalyptic rubble of all of the services that people have abandoned. Like every one of those services requires staffing, pagers, all of those things. There's overhead for every layer that you add. Um, oh, one point about the last slide, too, is I read a really good article recently. I think the author was Dan McKinley. He may even be here, um, about making boring infrastructure choices. I strongly endorse boring infrastructure choices. Um, whenever you're thinking about consolidating on shared infrastructure, the most stable thing that you can pick is probably the best choice. And if you think you have requirements that, that are going to require building something new, try to think again. Like, maybe you don't need that. Um, shared systems require lots of coordination. Uh, you also have to bother migrating all of the other users, and this takes a lot of overhead. When I was running the GWIS SRE team, which is the web serving SRE team, um, we looked after the homepage servers, which hosted Google's homepage and like, a lot of images and stuff like that. And people would come to us all the time, and they'd be like, I just have like, five gigabytes of images that I want to host. It's just like a marketing campaign or something or a new product. Um, can we put them on your servers? Because you already have some. And we would have to say no, because we could only put as many files on those servers as would fit on a single machine, because that's how the thing worked at the time. Um, but, and that was, that was mostly okay. Most people would just kind of start up their own like, kind of small uh, HTTP server, and it would be fine. Um, but every now and then, a larger team would, need, would really need this, and then they'd have to go and put in a lot of investment in building this system for themselves. So eventually, we decided that we were going to try and tackle this as a shared infrastructure project. Um, we took, uh, we made, made a partnership with a couple of the large customers who were trying to do this. Um, we worked with them. We built a shared solution instead of a specific one. It didn't cost a lot more than it would have to just, you know, for any of them to build their own. Um, but what we were able to do there is to build a system that abstracted a lot of the maintenance overhead. Um, it was hosted. It was maintained. It had SREs that looked after it, so no one had to worry about that. It was only like maybe a 5% tax on any given team that had their own servers. But it was a 5% tax on every team. And over a big enough organization, like, that kind of adds up. Um, but it took two years. And the reason that it took two years is that we had to make sure that no user in that system could hurt another. Um, Google's biggest DOS attacks always come from ourselves, uh, because we have really big systems. Uh, you know, Every now and then, someone will show up and try to give us a run for our money. But really, like, we're more capable of hammering ourselves into the ground than anybody else is. So this is true for all systems. They have to protect themselves in this phase as well. Um, you need isolation between users. You want to make sure users can't overwrite each other's changes. Um, ideally, a shared system should be self-service. You don't want to be in a state where someone's having to file a ticket every time they want to interact with your system. Um, the human overhead of that gets really high. This is kind of what I was talking about, about shuffling complexity around. This is a case where you can kind of take a hit on the dev side and really win out in the long-term operation of the system. So eventually, you come to a place where you ask yourself, this is a mess. Is it time to start over? The answer is almost always no. 
Um, every now and then, you may actually be better off starting small with a new code base and kind of migrating things a piece at a time. Um, or you may decide that you want to refactor in place. But the thing about second systems is if you try to go away for two years and build the perfect thing, perfect, it's going to be great this time. Um, two years later, you come back, and even if you hit it completely, the world has changed in that time, and you have no idea whether it meets the needs of your users. So a few tips in this phase. Um, get stuff in production early and often. Take the smallest possible case of the thing. Get it rolling. Try it out. See if it actually works. See if it works the way that you think it will. Um, if you're not expecting to get really new capabilities out of doing this, don't do it at all. Uh, but some changes do really require planning ahead. And so it's really important to know when those times are. Now, years ago, the Google Web Server used to be single-threaded. And that was fine for a while, because when we wanted more of them, we just like, added more instances. And that's fine when there's like two on a machine, or four on a machine, or eight on a machine. But the machines were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so once you start looking at like 32 or 64 on a machine, you're sort of like, well, that's kind of a lot of RAM overhead. And the other thing is that every layer, adding boxes to any layer in a distributed system adds a lot of overhead for the systems in front of and behind. So eventually, you're kind of damning yourself. Um, so we made the call that we were going to refactor. Uh, and the team decided they were going to refactor in place. And so every week for two years, they submitted another CL that moved like one more request flow over to being multi-threaded. And it took an enormous amount of time. Like It was a huge endeavor. And it wasn't clear when we started out that it was ever really going to be needed. Like They were like, really? How many? You know, Sure, that 10,000 nodes that we could have sounds like a long way off. Um, but within a month or so of the project being ready to complete, we ran out of the ability to add more web servers behind the load balancing layer. Like, it was just too many. Um, and so we were really lucky that we had made that early investment, because we would have been in a world of hurt if we were facing that two years down the line. So my other rule about second systems is that you have to move the biggest customer first. Um, there's a strong tendency to want to pick like a smaller case, um, you know, something that's sort of smaller, medium-sized. But if you do that and you really optimize for that case, you'll, you'll never know if you're going to be able to move your biggest, and you probably won't. Like, if you want to build a race car, there's kind of no point in starting with a cardboard box. And so in terms of just sort of managing things over the long term, my biggest rule is, like, don't let the weeds get higher than the garden. The thing that you need to do at any given point in time might be different, but you need to be paying attention to what's costing time, what's costing flexibility, what's costing velocity, like what's costing you trouble, and make sure that you're investing a little bit all of the time in whatever that is. And take care of your team. I mentioned it early, and I'm going to mention it late as well, but really, it's, it's hard to do this if you're managing a lot of churn. Um, it implies changes in direction. It implies changes in people. So lastly, remember that there's not really a finish line. It's an infinite game, right? Like, there's no point at which you're going to declare victory on your system and walk away. Um, all successful systems are evolving beasts. It's easy to get really fixated on specific decisions, like exactly where you store the config files and all of that stuff. But as long as you put them somewhere that's roughly organized, you're probably going to be better off. <laughs> So don't get wound up in the details. Pay attention to what you're really trying to achieve, your users, your system, your service, your company, your team, um, but particularly like whatever your company is trying to do. Um, keep your eye on the outcome. Correct when necessary. And frankly, all of the rest is details. All right. Thank you.